Hello everyone, welcome to Eye on Africa. Here are your headlines on this Friday. Mali's transitional president is sworn in as the transition process continues after last month's coup, but ECOWAS nations say more progress must be made before sanctions are lifted. A popular Rwandan movie star admits to supporting a rebel group, but rights organizations cast doubts over the legitimacy of his arrest and the case against him. And it's been more than six months since the border between Algeria and Tunisia was closed because of the coronavirus pandemic. That has taken a serious toll on the livelihood of hundreds on both sides of the border. But first, we begin in Mali, where transitional president Ba Ndao and transitional vice president Asimi Goita were sworn in this Friday, more than a month after a military coup overthrew Ibrahim Boubacar Keita. In a speech to the nation, President Ndao told Malians he would work to return the country to a properly elected president. Journalist Mohamed Salah joined us earlier from, ba from Bamako. He explained what would come next in the transition process. A lot of pressure came from the West African Regional Board, ECOWAS, even after the swearing in of the transition president and vice president, ECOWAS still mentioned its pressure. The West African Regional Board wants the new authorities to nominate a civilian prime minister before lifting sanctions put on after the coup of August 20. Next will definitely be the designation of a civilian prime minister in the next coming day, a sine qua non condition for ECOWAS to end the embargo against Mali. Um, remind our viewers, the, the June 5th movement, which is also known as the M5 RFP, those, that group was behind the demonstrations that paved the way for the, the coup that happened last month. But they've been very cautious and even reluctant to back the military junta. They continue to call for a civilian transition. How are they currently involved in the transition, in the, the, the inauguration that happened today and the transition in the next few days and weeks? It's true that uh, Genta and M5 RFP both agreed that they are the two key actors of change. But over the time, their paths are moving apart. The movement of June 5 have rejected the charter of the transition issued after the national consultation. They opposed the procedure for the appointment appointment of the president and vice president of the transition. Those different positions within the movement have created division and frustration. However, tractations are still on for the designation of the prime minister. Uh, and 5 RFP would even have provided names for the junta. And 5 RFP is not left out of the procedure, the composition of the next government will determine whichever or not uh, they will occupy department portfolio or not. To Rwanda now, Paul Rusesa Bagina, the man portrayed as a hero in the movie Hotel Rwanda, admitted in court this Friday that he had backed the National Liberation Front, a rebel group, but he denied any involvement in any violence or killings. The 66-year-old had lived outside of Rwanda for almost 25 years, but suddenly reappeared in handcuffs in the country last month. Human Rights Watch says Rusasa Bagina was, quote, forcibly disappeared. France 24's Mukelwa Shlachwayo has more. Paul Rosasa Bagina was known as a hero who saved more than a thousand people during Rwanda's genocide in 1994. Now he faces 13 charges that include terrorism, the financing and founding of an armed group. Today he appeared before court in Kigali to appeal a ruling that had denied him bail just last week. Uh, Paul Rosasa Bagina today said that he had indeed helped to form the National Liberation Front, also known as the FLN. This group has also um, admitted or taken responsibility for a series of attacks in Rwanda. 
Rusesa Pekina said uh, the formation of the FLN was meant to be an armed group of the opposition and not a terror group. He also said that his role within the group was just a one of diplomacy. Um, opposition members we spoke to who are living in exile at the moment say that it's possible that Paul Rusesa Pekina made these statements under duress. They say that the uh, track record of the Rwandan government reveals that they often uh, force false statements out of political prisoners. Already, uh, several critics of the government have been assassinated abroad. Human rights activists also say that uh, the uh, circumstances under which he was arrested uh, are murky. Uh, some members of the opposition say that he was tricked uh, and then kidnapped in Dubai before being taken to Kigali, where he was paraded before the press days later. Paul Rusasa Begina rose to fame after the Hollywood movie Hotel Rwanda depicted how he saved lives during Rwanda's genocide. Um, shortly after the genocide, he went into exile, where he began to criticize the government of President Paul Kagame, saying that it had caused uh, the political space to shrink and had been ruling the country uh, with fear and also crushed any critics of the government and any kind of political opposition. The coronavirus pandemic has had severe consequences on health and business around the world, and that includes towns along the Tunisian-Algerian border. The two countries are major economic partners with businessmen and women benefiting from a 2008 trade deal that allows goods to cross the border with limited restrictions. But that border has of course been closed since March, making life very difficult for business on both sides. Lilia Blaise and Hamdi Tlili have this report. In Kalat Sanen, in Tunisia's northwest, the Algerian border is only a few kilometers from the city center. The majority of locals make a living from reselling goods they buy cheaply in Algeria and bring into Tunisia after avoiding customs duties. <laughs> بالنسبة للصيف وكاشتاء تو بش نهبطوا سلعة جديدة مثلا كباب وتنهبطوا سلعة أخرى وكذا بش نخلو على روحنا تعبين تو عنا لحد مسكن نستنى وقت يشيل. Many families have been affected by the border closure. فيا بكل سرعة تبزي وعندي أختي فيا أربعة أولاد الأربعة يخلو على حد تو حبس يخلو مزود على حد حبس قلت المزود قلت لا بدي كل. Further north, the city of Tabarka nestles between the sea and the mountains. Last year, it welcomed nearly one million Algerian tourists. Hotels depend on these clients. L'année dernière ou les années qui ont précédé, donc il y avait de la clientèle qui venait même après l'été, même puisque il y a le week-end de prolonger, donc ils viennent en Tunisie, donc pour soit pour des courts séjours, des longs séjours. Donc tourisme national, il a perdu une grande partie de sa clientèle. Trade between the two countries has decreased. In Tunis, this Tunisian-Algerian shoe factory had to reduce its workforce because it could not export enough of its footwear. Normalement, il y a une personne hein, qui travaille ici, et on était obligé de, de réduire le nombre. On a dû garder la marchandise ici. On l'a pas exportée, ce qui a influé un peu sur notre chiffre d'affaires. Tunisia is worried about the repercussions of this extended closing of its borders. It's already suffering from the loss of trade with neighboring Libya after armed conflict erupted there in 2011. Finally tonight, more than 600,000 people have been forced to flee their homes in South Sudan over the past two months after weeks of torrential rains. Those rains were so heavy they caused the river Nile to burst its banks. So far, 124 people have died. Laurent Bersacher has more. A country underwater. As deadly floods continue to sweep through South Sudan, refugees flock daily to this makeshift camp north of the capital. Since arriving, many say they've been left to their own devices. <laughs> Torrential rains have been battering South Sudan since mid-July, causing the Nile to burst its banks. The floods, which are thought to be the region's worst in over a hundred years, have already displaced more than 600,000 people. 
They've also damaged much of the country's infrastructure, including roads and airports, further impacting the already complex delivery of humanitarian aid. A catastrophic situation for a country still reeling from a bloody civil war and which was already in the midst of a food crisis as well as a global pandemic. They were already having challenge actually meeting the food need in those countries. And then you add the flooding to it and then you have a situation where you have flooding, food insecurity and you add COVID to it. South Sudanese authorities, which declared a state of emergency earlier this month, recently called on the international community to step up donations and relief efforts. According to the UN, the floods have left the country in need of an additional $40 million by the end of the year. Well, that wraps up this edition of Ion Africa. Thank you very much for watching. The news continues on France 24 right after this.